Well, good morning, beloved. Happy Sunday. You look good. You're a wonderful, wonderful congregation, and so grateful to share this time with you. We are a Great Commission church, which means we are committed to making disciples uh, for Jesus Christ, immersing them in the Trinitarian presence, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them, Jesus said, to do everything I've commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the ends of the earth. Well, teaching uh, all that Jesus commanded is found in the Sermon on the Mount, and that's why we're spending a little bit of time. Now, we're not going into great depth in this. We're doing kind of a structural uh, uh, look at the Sermon on the Mount, hopefully to give you some real interest to go back and spend more time with it. I got interested in the Sermon on the Mount 60 years ago as a seven-year-old. Yeah, that's how old I am. <laughs> with my little baby dedication Bible that I brought, and I noticed the first pages that they were a lot of them read, and I we got interested in Matthew 5 through 7. That was the first big block of red letters in my little Bible. And kind of like that river in Ezekiel 47, the further it gets, the deeper it gets. And the more time you spend in the Sermon on the Mount, the deeper and deeper it gets. And, of course, all of the teachings of Jesus uh, come under the heading of the kingdom of God. Everything that Jesus taught did, preached, lived, was under the heading of the kingdom of God. He communicated, he came to reveal the, the kingdom of God, which is now here. And so we see that in the Sermon on the Mount, everything. First of all, righteousness in the kingdom, which sur surpasses the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. It is righteousness by faith, the righteousness of God, which is by faith in the king. And then love for the Father, which takes on expression. Uh, uh, but love for the Father that you see in the Sermon on the Mount. When, when you look at the relationship with, between, uh, the, uh, the, between you and, and God's word in Matthew 5. And the fulfillment of it that you see in, in Jesus and then in acts of kindness, of acts of mercy, of giving and praying and fasting. And then fellowship with others. What we look at today, the transition in chapter 7. As Jesus talks about what does it look like in the kingdom with his righteousness, loving the Father, you also love one another. And you have fellowship with one another. And that's what chapter 7, as Jesus begins, actually the the this section is verses 1 through 12, but it was way too much for us to try to, to try to do this morning. We'll try to finish this next, next uh, Sunday with verse 7 through, through 12. But to look at the Sermon on the Mount, you're looking at the life of the king. That's why I entitled this series, Life in the Kingdom is the Life of the King. You don't look at the Sermon on the Mount and try to do it. You look on the Sermon on the Mount and recognize that Jesus already did it. And he invites you to allow him to be your life. And as you trust him uh, with your life, you know, Jesus uh, said that we'll see later in chapter 7, talking to the false prophets, that said, uh, we did all these things. And Jesus says, depart from me, I never knew you. And sometimes we mistakenly ask the question, do you know the Lord? No, the real question is this, does he know you? In other words, have you trusted him with your life? You only do that with people that you want to know you. And uh, all guards are down, all disguises are removed so that he will know you. Does the Lord know you? And the only way that he can is if you trust him. Well, as we're looking at the Sermon on the Mount, we're looking at the gospel, the good news of life in the kingdom right now. Now, I was raised uh, a Southern Baptist, in Southern Baptist Church, and, 
And uh, that's my baggage and upbringing and influence and everything. And it seems like we put a lot of emphasis on the beginning of salvation and the end of salvation to the neglect of the middle. In other words, we've put a lot of emphasis on coming to know Jesus Christ as your Savior and pray this prayer and you'll be saved. Amen. And what does that mean? That means you go to heaven when you die. All right. And then we leave out the middle part. It's like, okay, we baptize them, throw them a towel and a Bible and say, okay, go get them, son. Go, go get them. Listen to me very carefully. Jesus Christ did not primarily come to get us into heaven. He came primarily to get heaven into us. That's what he came to do. That's what it means that the kingdom of heaven is now here. You don't have to wait till you die. Now, certainly Jesus came to get us into heaven, and we want to get as many people into heaven as we possibly can. But we will neglect so much of the Great Commission if we don't do what Jesus did in getting as much of heaven into people as we possibly can, which is his life as their life. And that's why the, the teachings of Jesus is so important. And as I've said, I want to say it again, Jesus is his teaching. Christ is Christianity, full stop, period. And so as we look at this section, now remember it's taken a transition. We're talking about fellowship now with one another. Loving one another, which is what Jesus did and uh, demonstrated, was criticized for, and so will we. We've got to make sure we understand the disclaimer because the world doesn't act like this. And especially in our culture. Because when Jesus said, judge not, that you be not judged. Let's just look at it again. I know Kyle has already read it, but I don't want to hear it again. <laughs> judge not, that you be not judged. For with the judgment that you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there's a log in your eye? You movie star. <laughs> That's what a hypocrite was, an actor. It's not real. You hypocrite. First, take the log out of your own eye. Then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Do not give dogs what is holy. And do not throw your pearls before pigs lest they trample them underfoot and turn and attack you. Have you ever wondered what that verse 6 means? Wow. I hope we don't run out of time because I want to get to that and explain it. But it is the, the last verse. And it is key in context to understanding how Jesus is teaching us about loving one another and what that looks like. And here's what it does not look like, judging one another. He says that right off. Stop judging one another. Stop condemning one another. And, uh, and here's the reason. He says, for or because, when you do that, you're judging yourself. Or another way to say that is this. People who judge other people feel judged by other people all the time. <laughs> That's why they judge other people. Because they feel condemned by other people. And that probably started on the playground in the third grade when someone called you chicken <laughs> or some other bad name that condemned you as we don't want you in our crowd. In fact, if you were gone tomorrow, we wouldn't even miss you. And here's the problem with that. When you believe that, that's how you start treating other people. Isn't that um, weird? That's just downright weird. That we end up doing the very thing that hurts us the most. That's the nature of sin. That's the deceitfulness of sin. And so Jesus tells us. Now here's the other reason. And it's very obvious because Jesus judged people. Oh yeah. Woe to you Pharisees, he said. That's judging and, uh, and some have said, that's a, 
Jesus must be talking about something else here because he turns around and does it. No, here's the deal, brother, sister, beloved. In God's kingdom, there's only room for one judge, and you're not him, and neither am I. <laughs> As the, our good teacher, Henry Blackaby, said, that was the light on experience that he had as a child that I'm not God <laughs> he is and I am not Jesus can judge because the father gave him and him alone all authority and no one else has been given that and one of the things that may help you when you start feeling yourself looking at a person in a critical way in a judgmental way, condemning them because of their behavior or whatever, that you remember what Jesus did that made him worthy of receiving all authority by the Father. He suffered and bled and died, not only for you and me, but for the whole world. And the experience in the Garden of Gethsemane, this is one of the things that will check me from time to time is, I start recognizing, uh-oh, I'm getting there. And then I, I, rem, I remind myself, you know, Stahl, you've never sweat blood, have you? No, never have sweat blood. Never been under that kind of intensity, that kind of stress. Jesus has. And Jesus and Jesus alone is worthy to judge. He is the judge and shares that with no one. That's kind of the main reason to stop judging one another. Now, some will try to say, well, yeah, I don't want to judge a person because I probably, maybe I hadn't done it quite as bad, but I've done bad enough. You really can't, you, you really can't change this by comparison. You can't compare yourself. When you do that, you're judging. Good grief. No, don't, don't even go there. Just hear what Jesus is saying and recognize that we are not to judge one another by, their, by people's behavior. You say, well, yeah, but, but uh, look what they're doing. That's wrong. Aren't we to be critical? Aren't we to be able to discern good from evil? Oh, yeah. But as we'll see here in a moment, uh, maybe not the way that we think. Jesus is... Uh, uh, demonstrating to us and he's giving us some instruction how to be critical and how to be discerning but here's where it starts not with another person made in the image of God who is an eternal spirit being that you don't have enough information on it even with yourself why do you keep doing the same thing you do you don't know that how are you gonna cut past judgment on somebody else <laughs> how are you gonna understand what they are doing when you don't even understand yourself why I keep doing these things. And so we are to stop that condemnation. You can maybe go back and see where it started. Well, it doesn't make any difference. I am to practice. And in our cancer, cancer, canceled, canceled culture, that's getting harder and harder to do because that is the definition of canceled culture. I reject that person because of what he just said. They're not on my radar any longer. And that's become a virtue even in our culture today. Jesus says, stop it, stop it. Now, he says something kind of extreme here. How can you help somebody get a speck out of their eye when you've got a, a tree coming out of your eyes? <laughs> that's, that's funny. But it's not funny to us because we can't even picture that kind of thing. But it is an exaggerating. It's, it, Jesus is making a point by exaggeration. First of all, you, if you're going to help somebody get something out of your, their eye, you're going to have to get up real close to them. But let me tell you something. They're not, gonna, uh, they're not about to let you get near them if they don't know you very well. Or another way to say that, you don't just let anybody dig something out of your eye. <laughs> Do you? Oh, no. <laughs> you better know them real well, and they better be very careful, and then the jury's still out on a lot of them still. Now, I'm not so sure. And because we've all had that experience, one little thing, and it's just all of a sudden everything shuts down. I can't, I've got to take care of this big need. But 
I'm not going to just let anybody go messing around in there. The point that Jesus is making is this. We're to stop judging people, but we are to be very discerning about how we help other people. That's what fellowship in the kingdom is all about. Loving one another by serving one another. Helping each other. And in order to do that, we've got to be extremely careful that our hurting, that our helping is not hurting. There's the book entitled that. I highly recommend it. When helping hurts. It ought to be required reading for every benevolence committee and every mission missionary that goes on the mission field. Because haven't we maybe been on the receiving end, but certainly we have been on the giving end of trying to help somebody only to see that it made things worse. And here's the reason, because we weren't careful to really understand what is needed here. We love to just throw money at it or throw it. You know, throw a can, some canned food at it. That'll take care of it. That way they can't go out and buy beer and cigarettes, you know, what they're really, those people. <laughs> That's what they really want. Can you see how destructive that is, how that, how that chokes fellowship with one another? And so Jesus is saying, if you're going to, and he tells us, if you're going to help somebody get a speck out of their eye, and he does tell us that's, what you're going to do that there's something that must happen first first of all you're going to have to take care of your view of that person you're going to have to make sure that you really see them and that you really understand in other words what kind of a relationship do you have with that person that you're wanting to help so much or do you want to just help them to relieve some guilt feeling that you have a lot of that goes around to manipulate with guilt so that, okay, I'll take care of that need. Now I've done that. Hey, I've already given it the office. Thank you. And, and away we'll go. To relieve some kind of, that's not, that's not it. Jesus is teaching us something very important here. How we are to be critical. But we are to be critical and discerning the best way to help another person regardless of who they are and what they've done or not done because that's what it means to have a fellowship and love one another in the kingdom we serve and help one another and then when jesus so that's what that's, that helps you understand this verse six so you don't just give what is holy to dogs you don't take a bucket of pearls into the pig pen because they're looking for something to eat and you pour out those pearls in that trough and they're going to try to eat that and they're going to get upset and turn on and say well, can't eat that I'll just eat him and a pig will <laughs> they will those of you who've been around them you know that don't, don't mess with them but of course what Jesus is saying is this he's not calling people dogs or pigs obviously he is saying know what other know what another person really needs before you start cramming the gospel down their throat because a lot of that has been done which by the way is the reason that many people once they graduate high school graduate college and once they graduate high school they graduate church and Christianity why because they had stuff pushed on them the whole time and respectfully waited until they were on their own to say I'm not having any of that anymore giving what is holy to someone that's not quite ready for that in that way at that time. We've got to be so discerning, so discerning how we help another person. And, of course, that requires, first of all, allowing Jesus to help us get that wrong view, that blindness out of my eyes so that I can see clearly enough what is going on here? God created us in his image to have dominion and subdue, to make critical decisions between good and evil. Not in terms of calling this person good and this person evil, but in terms of this help good and this help evil. Because this help could cause more harm than good. 
Let me tell you a quick story on that one. A group of missionaries heard about an unreached tribe there in the Congo and, and went share the gospel. They got there and sh preaching the gospel. They learned that these that the women had to walk two miles one way for clean water and two miles back. They did that twice a day. But you go for water early in the morning, go to, for water late in the evening. Almost four hours a, a, in their day was hauling water. Now, I don't know if any of you have ever had hauled water before, but a pint's a pound the world around. That means five gallon, those five-gallon jerry cans, they call them yellow cans, that's, that's five gallons. That's 40, that's 40 pounds each. That's that's 80, 80 pounds walking. Try that. Well, they said, here's the obvious need. We can do something about that. They raised money and piped that water two miles from that source, that spring, all the way to the village. So all those ladies had to do was go over there and turn the spigot, fill on there, fill up there. That's a great idea. I mean, that's, that sounds right, doesn't it? You know I'm getting where you be ready. Here it comes. So much easier. Don't have to spend all that time and that effort. That really helped them. Within a few weeks and then the coming months, something started happening in that village that they had not had before. Domestic violence and divorce and worse. And they could not understand. In fact, they even said, we, we haven't had this. And they're confiding. They said, what happened? What happened? Finally, they got down to the bottom of it. Two hours in the morning, two hours in the evening, this is the only time that the women had together with each other, and they would talk to each other. They would share their problems with each You know how these women do. These women do. I wish I could edit that out, but it's already gone. It's already... <laughs> All the men know how that works. They, you know how those women are. Oh, they, weren't, they were not given that time. There was a great blessing to them. So what happened? They had to be around the old man all the time. Men, men, we really don't understand what's wrong with that. Sound like, but no, it, they started having arguments and fights, and even got worse and worse. All because they brought fresh water into the village. No, all because they didn't study the situation first. To try to find out and develop a relationship with these people. To try to understand what is the best thing that we could do to communicate the gospel and if we do know this it's not bringing the water into this village because that takes something else away from them it's more important than clean drinking water which is time that they were spending together that they needed and that had been part of their life since they were children it's just a it's just a small example and there's so many examples of what happens when we are not discerning in how to best serve one another in the kingdom. And so we end up casting pearls before swine, not individuals, but people who, are, who have not yet recognized, who, people who do not yet know what even to do with that, that could be, could be communicated in an entirely different way. You know, the only other time, a few chapters over in Matthew, you read about when Jesus took his disciples way up into Tyre and Sidon area. And remember when the Canaanite woman came to him? First came to Jesus begging him, my little daughter is oppressed by, de by demons. Come and help us. And, and it seemed strange to us. Jesus didn't even answer her, didn't even look at her. And... Uh, uh, then she went to his disciples. She didn't get anything from Jesus, so she went to his disciples. And his disciples came and said, would you, do, would you tell that lady to go away? She keeps begging us to do this. And Jesus makes the statement, said, you don't give what is holy to dogs. And then the woman came back and said, yes, but even the little children let crumbs fall for the pets. Oh, Jesus loved that. She told a parable to him. <laughs> and of course, the Jews' dogs were unclean, but the Gentiles' dogs were pets. And uh, don't raise your hand if you'd let food fall from the table for your dog, too. 
But Jesus loved that because he was teaching his disciples the important principle of to the Jews first, then to the Gentiles, and staying in that order. He was tempted to go around that many times. In John chapter 12, even the last week of his life, when Greeks came to him, after the Jewish leadership had rejected him, and the Greeks came to him and said, we would see Jesus, we want to see Jesus. And he was tempted to bypass the order. The Gentiles would see Jesus in time, but in God's timing. And that has so much to do with how we serve and how we help one another and the timing of it. And it requires, first of all, to be helped by God, to remove the blinders, to remove the, the barriers so that I can see clearly what God wants to do in that person's life. And then to have the courage to say when somebody comes and says, no, this is what I need, this is what I need, to have the courage to say, I'm sorry, brother, I don't have that. But what I do have, I give you. I can pray for you, and I will do that. Which begins in verse 7, teaching us how do we stop judging and how do we start judging our help to one another? It starts with me. I know that. And then with serious and earnest prayer so that whatever I do, I do because the Father is doing that. And that's what brings him glory and us joy and strength. Amen. And hallelujah.